Salve, benvenuti, l'audio funziona, sì. Siamo un po' in ritardo, quindi dovremo, dovremo correre. Mm. Qui c'è un problema, che siamo tanti e saremo sempre di più nel pianeta. Vi do solamente i dati di un continente, quindi un pezzo di pianeta, che è un continente però importantissimo anche per la partita dell'alimentazione dell e di un'alimentazione sostenibile. L'Africa oggi ha 1 miliardo e 200 milioni di abitanti, nel 2050 ne avrà 2 miliardi e mezzo e per fine secolo avrà quasi quadruplicato, anzi più che quadruplicato, la sua popolazione. Non stiamo parlando di tanti anni, cioè oltre 4 miliardi di persone nel 2100, ormai siamo praticamente nel 2020. Ehm, bisogna dargli da mangiare a queste persone, ehm, però bisogna farlo in un modo che sia più attento, eh, sicuramente di alcune modalità scelte finora. E l'agroecologia di cui parleremo oggi è una possibile risposta a questa sfida enorme che attende un continente, ma in realtà un pianeta intero. Come fare a creare cibo in una maniera sostenibile, e lo affronteremo dopo ancora di più, anche mettendo in relazione una sostenibilità ecologica con una sostenibilità sociale ed economica. Ma questo lo vedremo più tardi. Io vorrei aprire invitando a parlare eh, sul podio Luis Elma Meche, eh, Vice Ministro dell'Agricoltura e della Sicurezza Alimentare del Mozambico, un paese che, sta, che, che ha un potenziale enorme nel settore agricolo e agroindustriale e sta, poi lo vedremo più tardi anche con il sostegno della cooperazione italiana che organizza questa Uh, questa conferenza del, dell'Unido, quindi delle Nazioni Unite, sta approvando alcuni progetti pilota proprio in, uh, di agroecologia o comunque di, una, di un sistema uh, sostenibile. Vice Ministro. Buongiorno a tutti. Moçambique sta in una localizzazione geografica vantaggiosa na Africa Austral, bagnato pelo Oceano Índico, con un accesso privilegiato para os mercados regionais e internacionais. Moçambique tem una costa con 2.700 km di extensão, porta di entrada natural para os mercados do Médio Oriente, Mediterrâneo e Ásia. Em termos de infraestruturas, tem estabelecido corredores de desenvolvimento ligando os principais portos de Maputo, Beira e Nacala, através da linha férrea e estradas, o acesso aos países da região da SADEC, com um potencial de mercado de 250 milhões de consumidores, uma população de 28,8 milhões de habitantes. Moçambique ocupa uma área de aproximadamente 80 milhões de hectares, dos quais 36 milhões é terra arável para o desenvolvimento da agricultura. Em termos de análise do setor agrário, o governo de Moçambique elegeu quatro setores como prioritários, nomeadamente a energia, turismo, infraestruturas e agricultura. Sendo o setor agrário um dos pilares identificados pelo governo para impulsionar o desenvolvimento da economia de Moçambique e tem apresentado um excelente desempenho nos últimos anos, nomeadamente para o setor que emprega maior 
número em cerca de 80% da força de trabalho total. O setor contribui com cerca de 22,5% do PIB. Entre 2015 e 2016, a produção do setor da agricultura cresceu numa média de 2,6%. A agricultura em Moçambique oferece crescentes vantagens comparativas apresentando num vasto potencial recursos hídricos combinado com diversos microclimas que permitem a produção de uma grande variedade de produtos agrícolas, destacando o seguinte. Alta disponibilidade de terra, arável, cujo potencial de 36 milhões de hectares apresenta um nível de utilização de 16%, equivalente a 5,4 milhões de hectares aproveitados. Extensos recursos hídricos, destacando grandes rios como Zambese, Limpopo, Lúrio e outros que oferecem enorme potencial para a irrigação. O clima em Moçambique é um clima tropical, com potencial de produção de culturas alimentares e de rendimento durante todo o ano. Nós temos um plano estratégico, que é o Plano Estratégico de Desenvolvimento do Setor Agrário, que nós denominamos pelo PESA, num período de 2011 a 2019. Este plano preconiza como visão que um setor agrário próspero, competitivo, equitativo e sustentável, capaz de dar respostas aos desafios de segurança alimentar internacional e alcançar mercados agrícolas globais. Em termos do, da nossa missão, é de contribuir para a segurança alimentar e aumentos de rendimento dos camponeses de uma forma competitiva e sustentável, garantindo a igualdade social de género. Nesses pilares do Plano de Desenvolvimento do Setor Agrário, nós contemplamos o aumento da produtividade e produção agrícola, de modo a aumentar a competitividade a infraestrutura e serviços para melhorar o acesso aos mercados, garantir a produção de alimentos e de segurança nutricional, o uso sustentável de recursos naturais. Aqui posso mencionar a componente do solo e da água, que realmente são importantes. Instituições agrárias reformadas e fortalecidas. Para o alcance deste Plano Estratégico de Desenvolvimento, Setoria, eh, Desenvolvimento Agrário, nós traçamos algumas metas, das quais é de garantir o, o crescimento do setor em média de pelo menos 7% por ano. A redução da subnutrição crónica de 44% para 30% em 2015, e em 20% em 2020. E, por último, é de reduzir para metade a proporção da, da população que passa fome. O Plano Estratégico de Desenvolvimento do Setor Agrário identifica seis corredores de crescimento para atrair investimentos no setor de uma Maputo, Limpopo, Beira, Vale de Zambésia, Nacala, Pemba, Lixinga e bem como as principais cadeias de valor que nós consideramos prioritárias. Em relação aos corredores de crescimento e de cadeias de valor prioritárias, nós destacamos 
o corredor de Pemba Lixinga, que tem como cadeias de valor a batata, o trigo, feijões, milho, soja, algodão, tabaco e frangos. No corredor de Nacala, destacamos as cadeias de valor, a mandioca, o milho, algodão, fruta, frangos e amendoim. Para o corredor de Vale de Zambésia, nós destacamos as culturas de arroz, milho, a batata, bovinos, caprinos, algodão e o frango. Para o caso do corredor da Beira, destacamos o milho, o trigo, hortícolas, frango, soja, arroz e bovino. E no quinto corredor, que é o corredor do Limpopo, destacamos o arroz, hortícolas, bovinos, frangos e, por último, no sexto corredor, nós destacamos arroz, hortícolas, bovinos e frangos. Para prioridades deste nosso setor agrário, nós temos que no setor foram identificadas seis prioridades de intervenção, nomeadamente a investigação, como prioridade na geração e transferência de tecnologia, assistência técnica aos camponeses, de modo a garantir dos serviços, o aumento dos serviços de apoio à produção agrária. Também destacamos a mecanização agrária através do estabelecimento dos centros de serviços, juntos das áreas produtivas agrícolas, alargando o seu potencial para abranger toda a cadeia de valor. A produção intensiva em termos de hortícola, pelo estabelecimento de estufas e o desenvolvimento de infraestruturas de irrigação. A produção intensiva de gado e aves, garantir o aumento da produção de frangos, ovos e de carnes vermelhas. Também, sem explorar a promoção de empreendedorismo a nível juvenil, através de programas de incubação de jovens. Também, nós como país, temos algumas oportunidades de investimento no agronegócio. Nas oportunidades para investimento no setor agrário, foram identificadas 15 cadeias de valor estratégico, nomeadamente horticultura, o arroz, feijões, a mandioca, o frango, carnes vermelhas, frutas, milho, banana, açúcar, gergelim, a batata, a castanha do caju, algodão, a soja e o trigo. Dessas cadeias de valor, nós, como setor, consideramos que sete são prioritárias para o investimento. Aqui passo a destacar a horticultura, o arroz, feijões, mandioca, frango, carnes vermelhas e frutas. A pot potencial do desenvolvimento de algumas cadeias de valor de frango, a procura de frango a nível do nosso país, em Moçambique, tem crescido significativamente e em toda a África espera-se que o consumo seja mais do que o triplo em 10 anos do que o atual consumo está cerca de 90 mil toneladas. Em termos das carnes vermelhas, em Moçambique apresentamos altos volumes de importações de carnes, principalmente da África do Sul, oferecendo uma oportunidade para a substituição destas importações. Alto potencial para a produção de suínos, bovinos e caprinos para o consumo com significativas 
oportunidades de exportação de carne de caprino para o Médio Oriente. A horticultura em Moçambique também apresenta condições agroecológicas favoráveis para a produção de hortícolas. O potencial para exportar para mercados do Médio Oriente e Ásia, a existência de compradores locais, de grandes superfícies e outros. Destacamos aqui a cultura de arroz, que Moçambique é o único país a nível da África Austral com as ótimas condições, destaco aqui, com as ótimas condições para a produção, onde 60% do arroz consumido a nível do país é importado, constituindo uma excelente oportunidade para a substituição das importações. O milho também é uma cultura alimentar básica em Moçambique e em todos os países da África Austral. Oferece uma oportunidade de investimento para a agroindústria. Os feijões, condições agroclimáticas favoráveis para a produção durante todo o ano. Quanto à cultura da soja, o aumento da procura de produtos alimentares e desenvolvimento da indústria, a vícola, a ração, apresenta 60% de custos para a produção, onde a soja apresenta 37%. Para os desafios ao agronegócio em Moçambique. O desafio ao agronegócio em Moçambique é de transformar as oportunidades do setor agrário na geração inclusiva de riqueza através de empregos e promoção de agricultores comerciais emergentes, jovens produtores e mulheres produtoras através do desenvolvimento de inovações e tecnologias agrárias apropriadas. Neste caso, nós temos a realçar que da melhoria no acesso à tecnologia e insumos mulherados e garantir o aumento da produtividade agrícola. A capacitação institucional, treinamento e formação aos agricultores, jovens, mulheres, através do alargamento dos serviços de extensão agrária e promoção de negócios inclusivos para jovens empreendedores agrários. Em termos das finanças, o nosso desafio é de melhorar o acesso aos serviços financeiros e de melhorar a gestão do risco. Para o desenvolvimento de infraestruturas, temos ainda como desafio melhorar a provisão de infraestruturas com destaques para estradas, eletricidade, previsão de unidades de agroprocessamento e, para o caso do acesso ao mercado, melhorar o acesso ao mercado pela promoção de exportações, feiras e informação do mercado. Minhas senhoras, meus senhores, com estas palavras concluo reafirmando que Moçambique oferece enormes oportunidades para o investimento estrangeiro em virtude de existir um vasto potencial, recursos hídricos e terra disponível, combinado com diversos microclimas que permitem a produção de uma grande variedade de produtos agrícolas e de origem animal. Desta forma, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, convido o setor privado aqui presente para investir em Moçambique, no setor agrário, através de parcerias com empresas moçambicanas 
que atuam no setor agrário com enfoque para a inovação e tecnologia com vista a dinamizar e calvanizar a agricultura, sendo o fim último o de impulsionar o agronegócio. Estou certa de que estas empresas presentes nestas, nestas cimérias sobre a inovação e tecnologia no setor agrário responderão positivamente ao nosso convite de virem investir em Moçambique. Gostaria de encorajar e agradecer ao Unido pelo esforço que tem feito para o desenvolvimento do setor agrário em Moçambique. Pela atenção dispensada, o nosso muito obrigada. Come avete sentito nel suo intervento i temi toccati dal Ministro sono stati tanti, eh, la necessità di creare lavoro, la necessità di eh, dare cibo, la necessità di sostituire quelle che attualmente sono importazioni da un punto di vista alimentare con produzioni eh, fatte in proprio. Oggi la maggior parte, il grosso dell'agricoltura, prendiamo il Mozambico, prendiamo l'Africa più in generale, è un'agricoltura di sussistenza. Ora, i numeri a cui bisogna rispondere sono così alti, i tempi in cui bisogna farlo sono così veloci eh, che spesso l'unica soluzione sembrano no, le grandi produzioni. Ecco, in realtà ci sono esempi dove il piccolo produttore che, che oggi rappresenta la, la, insomma, il grosso del, del settore agricolo nel continente, magari messo in fila, in filiera, sono dei, degli esempi che noi in Italia conosciamo bene, in cooperativa, eh, è in grado di raggiungere, non deve andare a cercare mercati lontani, ha i mercati dietro casa, la, la città, la, la grande città più vicina, quindi ci sono i mercati che sono quelli propri africani. Perché dico questo? Perché in realtà... La cooperazione, aggiungo finalmente, che mi era già partito di default, eh, da qualche anno comincia in maniera più palese a ragionare unendo eh, quello che è business, eh, quindi il mondo degli affari, con il eh, mondo della cooperazione vera e propria anche su un tema prioritario come quello dell'alimentazione. Ecco, eh, come tutti eh, queste realtà si possono incastrare, eh, si possono incastrare, anzi forse proprio il settore agroalimentare più di altri può essere un settore, eh, un laboratorio importantissimo di collaborazione tra chi fa cooperazione, chi fa affari, eh, chi si occupa di ambiente e sostenibilità. Devo dire che in questo ehm, sicuramente va anche un, insomma, tendiamo sempre un po' a sminuire le cose italiche, ma devo dire, la cooperazione negli ultimi anni sta lavorando davvero bene. Eh, cercherò di essere veloce, abbiamo un sacco di ritardo da recuperare, ma invito il direttore generale della cooperazione allo sviluppo del Ministero degli Affari Esteri, Giorgio Marrapodi, a intervenire sul palco. Grazie. Grazie, grazie anche per questa, per questa introduzione, per queste parole sulla cooperazione allo sviluppo e la cooperazione allo sviluppo degli ultimi anni è, una, è un settore che ha fatto, ha fatto degli sforzi, ha fatto degli sforzi proprio in, in questo senso, nel senso, eh, nel senso di, eh, di andare oltre quello che era eh, l'approccio tradizionale dell'aiuto allo sviluppo ad un, ad un sistema che è anche il, il risultato della legge di riforma, la legge, la legge 125 in cui ha cercato di mettere insieme tutti gli attori, gli attori pubblici, i privati, il mondo della società civile, le fondazioni, le università, i centri di ricerca. Quindi grazie per, grazie per, questa, per questa introduzione, però adesso faccio la, la, la mia, era cioè la prima di ogni altra cosa, vorrei Uh, fare un ringraziamento e i complimenti a, a tutti coloro che sono dietro 
all'organizzazione di Seeds and Chips e dietro all'organizzazione di questo evento. Noi abbiamo avuto il piacere di ospitare la presentazione di questa edizione di Seeds and Chips alcune settimane fa al Ministero degli Esteri ed è eh, questa è credo una delle, eh, delle legacy, come si dice, una delle eredità eh, più belle che Expo Milano ci ha lasciato, quindi grazie, grazie davvero agli organizzatori e eh, grazie agli organizzatori di questo, di questo evento. Il, abbiamo, oh, abbiamo sentito all'inizio oh, le cifre eh, sullo sullo sviluppo demografico nel continente, nel continente africano nel corso del, cioè del XXI secolo. Cioè, Un'altra cifra che voglio menzionare io è che, il, è che per la prima volta abbiamo assistito nel, nel 2016 a una crescita del numero dei mal, delle, delle persone malnutrite nel mondo. La, cioè la lotta alla, alla fame, alla, malnutri, alla, alla malnutrizione è, stata, è, stato, è stato un obiettivo eh, per prima dei Millennium Goals, poi adesso del, è uno degli obiettivi degli, S, degli SDGs, si era riusciti a, a, a procedere su un sentiero virtuoso di diminuzione progressiva per tanti anni, poi per la prima volta ci ritroviamo adesso con un numero che invece è in crescita. E, ehm, sono, sono 815 milioni le persone che tutte le sere vanno a letto, vanno a dormire con la fame, che si risvegliano il giorno dopo in, con, questa, eh, con le conseguenze di questa malnutrizione. Erano 777 milioni nel nel 2015 c'è un, un aumento di 38 milioni di persone e, e quindi questo ci pone il, il dilemma di come eh, affrontare, di come arrivare, a, a, di come riaffrontare il fenomeno, come riportarlo su una, uh, su una strada <ride> virtuosa tenendo conto di quelle cifre di aumento della popolazione, 4 miliardi alla fine, del, 4 miliardi in Africa nel, nel 2100 e, e numeri ancora più ampi sul, su, su tutto il continente. È una sfida, però è una sfida e come tutte, e questa è una sfida molto difficile, ma è una sfida che, eh, davanti alla quale non ci dobbiamo, non ci dobbiamo arrendere, non dobbiamo, in, eh, non dobbiamo indulgere al pessimismo e alla rassegnazione, perché la dimostrazione, proprio anche su quelle cifre, della malnutrizione, che dicevo prima, siamo, eh, eravamo riusciti per, un, per tanti anni con uno sforzo cioè di tutti gli attori a diminuire quelle cifre, questa è, è una delle dimostrazioni che con uno sforzo di sistema a livello, a livello globale i risultati poi si riescono a, raccol a raccogliere. E testimonianza in questo senso sono sempre anche alcune cifre, nel senso che se ricordiamo che nel 1970 c'era una persona su quattro che eh, soffriva di malnutrizione, nel, oggi quella razio è di una persona su dieci in una, in una popolazione che è molto aumentata rispetto al 1970. Allo stesso tempo e, e, e sono, sono aumentate le aspettative, le aspettative di vita nello stesso periodo, appunto dal 70, al, 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 nel 70 fino ad oggi è aumentato di 11 anni e la maggior parte di questa aspettativa di vita è cresciuta proprio nei paesi in via di sviluppo. Abbiamo, abbiamo ottenuto grandissimi risultati nella lotta alla tubercolosi, alla malaria, alla IDS, quindi ancora una volta a dimostrazione che le sfide, eh, si, le, le sfide si possono raccogliere e si possono anche vincere. Quindi tra chi eh, dipinge, dipinge Apocalisse, eh, dipinge <ride> l'Apocalisse, o invece più semplicemente ritiene che lasciando fare al progresso umano poi si troveranno sistemi, eccetera, io credo che noi l'approccio italiano è quello di un, eh, di un, ottimismo, di un, di un ottimismo realistico che va, che va coltivato, che va nutrito, per utilizzare una parola che oggi sentiremo molto, con, con l'innovazione che è il motto di, eh, di questo evento. 
Il, um, continuo, non so se io eh, continuo in italiano, continuo in inglese, non so com'è l'uditorio. Avevo... Allora faccio metà e metà. Allora continuo in inglese, va bene. Il, um, we are convinced that we can solve the, the dilemma that I was mentioning before. As long as we commit to a paradigm shift, to a paradigm shift towards more sustainable food systems, in the spirit of the cross-sectorial nature of, to the, of 2030 agenda, we must deal with agricultural development and environmental protection through a comprehensive, integrated approach. Indeed, we cannot deny that today's food and farming systems have managed to supply large volume of food to global markets. But we must also acknowledge that they are generating multiple negative outcomes, such as widespread degradation of land, water and ecosystems, high greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity losses. That's why we uphold the transition from the currently prevailing system of industrial large-scale agriculture and food production to agroecological systems based on diversifying farming landscapes, replacing chemical inputs, protecting biodiversity as part of holistic strategies to build long-term fertility and healthy agro-systems. This is the business model that has always characterized the Italian agri-food sector and that continues to be a trademark of our system with a new generation of young entrepreneurs who are revitalizing and modernizing that tradition. Consistent with this experience, agroecology is also the approach that inspires our development cooperation initiatives with partner countries. And I have discussed this with the minister, with the minister of Mozambique before this meeting. Let us be, let us be clear, we are not supporting agroecology for purely ethical reasons or environmental concerns. Data now available show that these systems can compete with industrial agriculture also in terms of total outputs performing particularly well under environmental stress, delivering production increases in places where additional food is most needed and empowering smallholder farmers and local communities. In partner countries, we are especially focusing on disseminating sustainable farming, processing and marketing practices, on improving quality and quantity of production, on promoting the, uh, the entrepreneurial role of rural women. We do so, just to give you a few examples, in Central America and in Ethiopia, in support to the coffee production sector, in Egypt to upgrade the cotton value chain, in Bolivia for the promotion of typical Andine seeds. Farmers are encouraged to move up to value chain by adding value to raw products through processing, packaging, and marketing their produce. They are also assisted in establishing cooperatives and association that can help them achieve economies of scale and get the support they need in difficult times, strengthening resilience to natural and man-made shocks. We are perfectly aware that our effort alone will not be sufficient. For this reason, the Italian Development Corporation supports new partnership with the private sector in order to attract responsible investments with civil society organization to better connect our policies with the actual needs of people we aim to help. With the United Nations Rome-based agencies, FAO, IFAD, and World Food Program, as well as Biodiversity International, CM, IMMB, UNIDO, and other international organizations whose activities and knowledge represent a critical asset in implementing rural and agricultural development projects in partner countries. 
I would like to clarify that, in our view, agroecology does not imply the sheer preservation of landscape and traditional crops. Instead, it is a rural sustainable development model based on knowledge, research, and innovation, which are key factors to strengthen technical and managerial know-how of small farmers, associations, and communities. As long as we use it to uphold human dignity, innovation can be a formidable tool to reduce inequalities at different levels. In the ownership of means of production, in the use of natural resources, in the consumption of nutritious food. Innovation in tradition, this is the motto we would like to share today with all our partners. Speaking about innovation, one of the most innovative elements of the 2030 Agenda is that it not only promotes justice and equality within our generation, according to the principle that no one should be left behind, but it, it also expresses a clear commitment to pursue justice among generations by safeguarding life on Earth in the long term. We believe that uh, we can rise to this challenge, we can be up to it, it, if only we are able to shift towards more diversified, sustainable, resilient, and fair food system. I thank you and I wish you all a very good day of work. Thanks. I would like to invite now on the stage Mariam, please, and uh, talking about the sustainable food systems, and she's the perfect one as a representative of an international panel of experts on sustainable food system, and you will set the scene. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be invited to present um, the report of the International Panel of Experts on Food Security and Nutrition. Um, uh, as a way to set the scene on this important discussion on agroecology as a prime example of innovation in tradition for sustainable food systems. Uh, so, sorry, let me just see if this, but yes. Um, this, is, uh, this is our report, which came out in 2016, but it's still very, very topical, uh, called From Uniformity to Diversity, What Characterizes the dominant food systems today is uniformity, uniformity in genetic resources, but also uniformity in um, markets, uniformity in diets at the end of the value chain. Uh, and what we're arguing for is that we need diversity in all of these levels, starting from the field, so in terms of biodiversity, but also what, what we see in many parts of the world is that in order to have biodiversity in the field, you also need a diversity of actors in markets, you need diverse, uh, as was just mentioned, small and medium-sized enterprises. And you need diversity in food traditions and diets so that somebody is actually welcoming and using um, the, the, this diverse food. You need a diversity in knowledge. So I just want to stress that when we speak about diversity, it's not just biodiversity. It's, it's diversity among all these different dimensions of our food system. So what is wrong with our food systems? In this report, we basically compare uh, uniform, intensive industrial uh, types of farming with agroecological diversified types of farming. And we compare them uh, on several dimensions, nutrition, impacts on human health, impacts on the environment, uh, social, but also economic uh, impacts, and also cultural impacts. And I will, um, I think I don't have time to go through all of them, but I will go through a couple of them just to give you examples of the problems that we are facing uh, today, which I think are more than problems, let's put the right word, they are crises. 
Uh, first of all, in terms of uh, the impact of these food systems on human health, this is something that in the past couple of years has become more and more of an issue. This figure is uh, from another report by the IPES panel, uh, which is specifically on the impact of food systems on human health. And we look at the impacts of the food system all the way from production through to processing, trade, and consumption. Uh, it's difficult to find figures, um, cost figures. In fact, there's a whole effort now in terms of um, uh, true cost accounting, but these are still early days. These are estimates. Um, some of them are for specific periods of time, some of them for, for one year. So I stress that they are not, don't, they're not all comparable, but they do give an idea. Um, look, for example, at the, the highest figure there. The estimate of a cost of $7 trillion is, is the estimated cost of non-communicable diseases, which, uh, it, and this is in low and middle income countries. Um, yes, low and middle income countries. Um, and this is certainly um, related to the way that we produce our food and what we produce, highly processed foods, uh, and produced with chemicals. Sorry, this is a hard button. Um, the impact uh, on the environment is perhaps the most significant and the most uh, debated and where we have the most data. This is the quite well-known planetary boundaries figure developed by the Stockholm Environment Institute. And you can see that on two of these, these are the, the, uh, the so-called um, uh, safe operating spaces of how we're living on the planet today. And on two of these dimensions, one being biodiversity at the top and the other being phosphorus and nitrogen flows towards the bottom, we're already surpassing the safe planetary boundaries. We're already in a red zone. Um, and, and both of these are very much related with how we produce our food. Uh, one of the real problems of intensive uniform uh, agricultural systems is that you enter into a vicious cycle. You start using, for example, chemicals to spray your pests, and those chemicals get rid of your beneficial insects, which means that you no longer have the support of biodiversity, this additional support to help you control your pests, which means that you have further threats on your productivity, and therefore you need to increase your spraying of the pests. So you enter into a vicious cy cycle on various dimensions. Uh, soil is another one where you, you use chemical fertilizers which degrade soils over time when they're used intensively, and therefore you need to add even more. We compare this uh, intensive system with a different paradigm. We just heard that we need a paradigm shift. We, we agree we need a paradigm shift towards agroecological systems. We compare them on all of the axes that are listed there, which I've already mentioned. And I'd like to highlight that what's really important about when you compare these two different paradigms is that agroecology is much more knowledge intensive. And this is significant for reasons which I'll get into later. But in an in intensive system, an industrial system, the farmer becomes something like a technician who simply uh, applies the formula that the, the, the pesticide sales company, for example, tells him or her to apply. Whereas when you're doing, for example, integrated pest management through farmer field schools, for example, you as the farmer need to observe your pests in the field. You need to know something about their life cycles. You need to know which are the, the so-called weeds in your field which might actually help to attract the beneficial insects which control those, um, uh, those pests. So in terms of the definition of agroecology, this is something very much debated. Um, what's emerging is that certainly the definition of agroecology has been expanding over the last couple of decades. We started being defined mostly by, by agronomists and agroecologists. We started talking about agroecology as the apl application of ecological concepts and principles in the management and design of sustainable agroecosystems. Increasingly, there's been more and more awareness, but also more and more evidence that in order to do these beneficial practices at the field level, we need to look at the wider food system. We need to look at markets. We need to look at governance of land and natural resources. And therefore, um, increasingly, agroecology is being seen as the ecology of the entire food system. What we're looking for is not just harmony 
among um, biodiversity in the field, but we also need harmony at a wider scale across the entire food system. I also want to stress that agroecology is something that's not only relevant for developing countries, um, but also very much for developed countries. Um, it's not that here in Europe, for example, we have a highly productive agriculture and therefore everything is good. As, as you know better than me, there are environmental crises in Europe uh, related with loss of biodiversity. Pollinators has been on the, uh, on, on the news headlines for the last couple of years. So both in developing countries and in developed countries, we need to shift towards agroecological um, landscapes and agroecological systems. Of course, I mean, this is a simplified um, uh, graphic. There are many starting points, and each of them might need a different mix of policies, but we all need to be moving in the same direction. So, in terms of the economic outcomes of diversified agroecological systems, in terms of productivity, this is, uh, the, we can see that over time, agroecological systems are just as productive as other systems, as was already mentioned. This also has to do with the way that we measure productivity, which is something that I'll get into soon. Uh, in terms of income, especially because you, you uh, farmers will avoid using costly inputs, um, but also because they can access uh, lucrative markets where consumers are more and more looking for healthy products. They have special niches. Uh, where agroecological systems really stand out uh, for, for a very high performance is on the res resilience and stability aspect. As was already mentioned, under environmental stress, under climate change, when you have biodiversity in your field, when you have healthy soils, when you have a mixture of trees and crops and livestock, you're much more resilient to, for example, a drought. In terms of environmental outcomes, we can, as I said, this is perhaps the most well understood aspect of agroecology. Number one, looking at climate change, agroecology makes agriculture a solution to climate change rather than agriculture being a, a problem through the use of better integration of trees, through cover crops, through rotation with legumes, we keep more carbon in the soil. The biodiversity is the absolute cornerstone of agroecology. Uh, whether you're talking about soil microorganisms, wild pollinators, uh, a diversity of crops in the field, this is absolutely key. Without biodiversity, there's no agroecology. Land, we've already mentioned, and as I said, the biodiversity leads to some of these ecosystem services, including pollination and pest and disease management. And therefore, in agroecology, instead of the vicious cycle of the industrial uniform system, what we have is a virtual cycle. So for example, uh, when you have greater um, integration between crops and livestock systems, you have better soil management. The soil allows you to have better water retention. The better water retention allows you to, to plant and cultivate a wider range of crops, which for example might attract pollinators, which then help you with your production. So you enter into a positive cycle. In terms of nutrition and health outcomes, um, certainly first and foremost in agroecology you avoid uh, or drastically minimize the use of uh, harmful inputs like pesticides but also antibiotics for um, livestock production and all of these have proven impacts on human health. There's also the point of dietary diversity. We know that we have about two billion people in the world uh, who suffer from micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, this is really related to the fact that the diets are not diverse enough. We're not eating, and not enough of us are eating enough fruits and vegetables. And with, agri with a diversified agroecological system, we produce more diverse diets. Um, and also in terms of the actual production system, there's evidence that in livestock, for example, when you have grass-fed animals, you have healthier um, milk and meat in terms of, for, for instance, their omega-3 fatty acids rather than grain-fed animals, I should say. In terms of the social and cult cultural outcomes of agroecological systems, this is really linked with what I said uh, earlier, that agroecology is knowledge intensive, but also labor intensive, uh, because you need the knowledge of the farmers, and the farmers are playing such an important role. It is labor intensive, but also, as I said, agroecology, biodiverse farming is linked with 
artisanal processing, local markets, all of this brings and keeps wealth in rural areas rather than extracting it in, in global value chains. And also the link with the consumers, of course, is something very, very important, as, as we've seen with uh, organic agriculture, I think. <laughs> you need my help, okay. So also the cultural aspect of, of, of uh, agroecology in terms of reviving local knowledge, food traditions, diets, and so on. So the major question, after telling you that agroecology is so much better than uh, intensive systems, the question of course is, why, are not, why do we see, not see it more supported, more in the field? Why are not more governments uh, supporting through policies? And we've taken a political economy lens to answer this question because we think that to, to, under, to really be able to answer this question, you need to look at who benefits from the industrial systems, who benefits from the agroecological systems, and who is making the decisions about the policies that we all live with. Uh, so we've identified eight lock-ins. Um, I, can I have maybe three more minutes, three, four more minutes? Because I really had two, two more minutes, okay. We've identified eight lock-ins, um, which, which are lock-ins which basically um, describe why we're locked into this system of intensive agriculture and it's very difficult to get out, even if there's a lot of support uh, f in terms of uh, understanding that we're going in the wrong direction. I'm going to highlight two of them. One is the one in the center, the concentration of power. I will give you some examples. And the other is the measures of success. But all of these lock-ins interact with each other. In terms of the concentration of power, we see in input companies, for example, but also in retail, we see a huge concentration in the number of companies, a very small number of com companies who control the seed sector, fertilizers, um, et cetera, grain trade. And you can imagine that these global companies have a huge influence on um, on policies, including research, for example. We're also living in an age where there's less and less public funding on research. More and more the private sector is stepping in. And uh, their interests lie in uh, supporting, continuing to support intensive systems. This is just a, a graphic to quickly show that even, so this is the mostly the, the, the food processing um, industry worldwide. And this shows that even if we see a huge number of different labels when we walk down the supermarket aisle, in fact, there's a huge concentration and only a handful of companies are behind the diversity of labels that you see uh, on your supermarket shelves, including more and more organic companies are being bought up by these large uh, players. Uh, in terms of, and here uh, there's not time to go into all of them, but these are some of the recommendations, the solutions that we propose one by one to get over these lock-ins. Uh, and I will mention the one on the measures of a success where we propose to have indicators. We need a radical change in how we measure the outcomes of food systems if we really want to move towards sustainability. So here, for example, instead of measuring net calo calorie production, which is really the green revolution approach of saying, okay, we have uh, 10 tons of corn per hectare, and, and the, the success of that is calories, whereas instead we need to be looking at nutrient content. Uh, we need to be looking at the micronutrients. We need to value that instead of valuing, for example, yield per hectare, uh, which looks at the yield of one particular crop. So it, it, it encourages you to look at your field in terms of a monoculture, whereas instead we need to look at total outputs. In an agroecological field, you have not only corn, but you might have a few trees, you might have a few chickens. Uh, research and policy makers only see the corn because they look at yield per hectare. Uh, productivity per worker is also another measure of success, which means the less jobs you have, the more successful you are because you're seen as efficient. Instead, we need to look at resource efficiency. How efficient are we in, in cycling our nitrogen, for example? Uh, quickly, in terms of the recommendations, as I mentioned, uh, we need new indicators. Without new indicators, we will not convince policy policymakers to go in the other direction because they won't be able to show that they're successful. Um, we need public support, and there are countries like Brazil, like Cuba, increasingly like China, France, who are coming up with policies that go in the right direction. 
we need short value chains, um, uh, we, need, uh, we need to strengthen movements and alliances between researchers, farmers' organizations, governments, the UN, for example, to support agroecology. Uh, we need to have food planning at all levels. In the city of Toronto, for example, they have food policy councils uh, to have intersectoral planning on a territorial level. And we need on-farm management of agrobiodiversity, which is currently um, blocked in many cases by seed laws, for example, that limit farmers' uh, capacity to save their own seeds. So, just the final message to leave you with, what we don't want is to turn from small-scale family farming into industrial agriculture. Both of these systems have to move towards agroecological systems. And finally, just to say that um, that uh, certainly in terms of the SDGs, certainly SDG 2 is the one which is most closely related to agroecology, but because of this more holistic approach of agroecology, we believe that agroecology can be relevant and can show impact on actually quite a number of SDGs. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I would like to invite now on the stage the, the panelists, Catherine Gatundo, Tiberio Chiari, Fabrice De Clerc, please come here with me, Biagio Di Terlizzi, Luca Turello, Andrea Carapellese e Marcella Villareal. Prego, lasciatemi l'ultimo a me. Leave me. I hope we have enough chairs, yeah. Allora, comincio con il chiedervi aiuto. Abbiamo, regia, il, mi devi mettere il tempo che manca a mezzogiorno. A, vedete lì, avremo il... no, non 12 minuti. Eh, avremo il tempo che manca a... Poi, poi ci staccano, cioè che siamo a Milano, la regia è tremenda, ha già detto che a mezzogiorno stacca. Per cui eh, quello che ci eravamo detto prima ovviamente salta. Abbiamo, eccoli là, abbiamo circa 5 minuti a testa. So I, I, I need your help now. I'm talking about, we have uh, 45 minutes and then the director will cut the line and we will be here talking by ourselves for all the time we want, but we have to leave the room. So just uh, help me and try because I would not sacrifice the question and answer time because normally it should be interesting to, to see if we have some reaction from the public. Non vorrei sacrificare la parte di domande e risposte, quindi vediamo se riusciamo a salvarla. Da chi cominciamo? Uh, Marcella Vigliareal. Mi aiuta un po' a capire, ehm, direttore della divisione partenariato Sud-Sud, is the director of the South-South Partnership at FAO, alla FAO, uh, un po' uh, um, riprendendo gli, le interessantissime eh, dati forniti da Mariam, un po' qual è il vostro, il vostro quadro, il quadro che avete avuto sull'agroecologia a livello globale, perché è un lavoro che eh, mi ha detto avete fatto, vero? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I don't know if the mic is on. It's a pleasure to be with you here uh, this morning. Um, I would just like to make a few points uh, after having listened to the very interesting uh, previous uh, presentations. I think that uh, um, one point we would like to mm, bring out from the point of view of FAO, um, I think most of the points of what is agroecology and why it is so important were very nicely uh, put uh, to the public, uh, both by the Director of Development Corporation and uh, Mariam. Um, but one point I think uh, which is quite important is the empowerment of farmers. Uh, the beauty of the agroecological approach is, is that it brings together different systems of knowledge and that it values the knowledge uh, which is local knowledge, which is traditional knowledge. So it values the knowledge of indigenous people, of pastoralists, of people who have lived 
uh, in, the, in the place, in the actual place, and have a f the most <coughs> in-depth knowledge possible about the local context. Agricol the agricultural approach has to be local. It's locally determined and it's locally developed, and it's locally developed with all of the actors together. That's a beauty. The idea is that uh, knowledge is co-developed, and so co-participation is another very important element of the agroecological approach, co-participation in the development of knowledge. Um, nobody owns the entirety of the knowledge. There is, of course, a lot of innovation. Mm, there's myths around the agroecological approach saying, oh, you know, this is, you know, you're putting aside technology and innovation. No, no, it's about technology, it's about innovation, but it's co-developed by the local actors, the external actors, together, bringing in uh, the advantages of different knowledge systems to solve local and locally developed problems. Uh, so the co-participation in research is a very important part, the empowerment of all of the actors, especially the local actors, the human social values, I think it was brought out uh, in the previous presentations uh, very importantly, uh, the responsibility, the governance, good governance structures, uh, but also the responsibility. Um, investment is needed, and agroecology recognizes that importance of increasing investment. Uh, however, it has to be done in a responsible way. For this, we have the principles for responsible investment in agriculture and food systems, the RAI principles developed by the Committee on Food Security. So I think those are quite important points. Now, I'd just like to um, um, share with the audience the process of agroecology and how it has been embedded in the work of FAO. So 2014, we had a major international summit on agroecology at FAO. After that, it has been followed uh, by um, symposia that have been done in all of the regions. And just two, three weeks ago, we had the second global summit on agroecology at FAO headquarters in Rome. Here, the outcome of, the, of this whole process is one, identifying region by region with the local specificities <clears throat> and local needs. For example, whereas by in, uh, in uh, Latin America, the approach is much more of a territorial na nature. Uh, in Africa, it's much more of a communal nature. Communal. In uh, Africa, for example, pastoralist systems are very important, very high up on the agenda. Not so necessarily in other parts of the world. So the agendas have to be developed locally with all of the actors, as I said before. Outcome of this last uh, summit we had, uh, as I said very recently, is the Scaling Up Agroecology Initiative. Okay. Uh, so the idea is that from now on, uh, FAO is going to be working. We have just launched this initiative. We would really um, welcome any comments on this initiative. Uh, and we will be working region by region, country by country, to develop locally important and locally uh, relevant approaches to agroecology uh, in terms of policies, in terms of systems of education uh, and knowledge, and obviously of bringing it up to scale, ensure that we're going to be reaching millions of people. I, I thank you, because the, the terms you are using uh, reminds me something that Luca Turello of Illy told me by phone, no? You, when we talked, quando abbiamo parlato, tu mi hai detto una delle questioni principali era la ricerca, lo sviluppo, la formazione, no? Poi soprattutto parlando di Africa. Illy ha un, uh, mi sento un po' schizofrenico al passare dall'italiano all'inglese, ma uh, Illy has an experience on coffee in Ethiopia uh, that is very, very interesting. I, I think all of you know the Illy, um, one of the main producers of coffee, good coffee. And when we talked by phone, you told me that, the same thing, not the need to, to just. <laughs> yeah, and I have it. Uh, the need to run this project, and uh, I love to have this experience with you need in Ethiopia. Uh, we support uh, this project in favor of uh, the coffee sector and the w how amazing it was uh, how this project would work, uh, working in two levels, the bottom level, working in the field and at the institutional level. It was mentioned that like, agroecology is uh, knowledge intensive. All the system is knowledge in intensive. It needs a lot of knowledge. And so for this, it's so related to education and we have to focus on that, education since the primary school. 
And research, yes, of course. Research is needed because uh, those sustainable systems are not fully discovered yet. It's not a recipe that you can apply to a farm, whatever farm, okay, let's do that. I can apply this formula of agroecology, it's not that. Because also should be linked to, to the market, even if it is a local, should be organized. Again, point is organization, so it is related to education. And a lot of research to put in this knowledge system. Thank you. Uh, who wants to go on, on this path? Uh, Biagio, probably you. No? The, 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 the formation, the research is something you are already in. Sì, ok, eh, grazie. Prendo spunto però dall'ultima parola, sì. quella education. Eh. In infatti noi siamo coinvolti <coughs> come organizzazione, come sede quindi italiana quindi del, del SIAM, come organismo che ha per mandato la formazione quindi di quadri. Quindi l'elemento quindi di poter caratterizzare quindi una forza quindi dell'innovazione all'interno dei paesi nasce attraverso anche lo strumento della formazione, a cui prestiamo molta attenzione e in tutta quindi questa nostra quindi vita, oramai oltre 15 anni, sono costoro che ci permettono di identificare necessità, di leggere quindi bisogni, di poter identificare quell'innovazione quindi sostenibile che poi possa essere una quindi soluzione a delle necessità quindi locali. E questo quindi lo, lo facciamo grazie oh, al sostegno della cooperazione italiana, sia quindi degli esteri che della stessa AIX, dove questo quindi modello quindi della filiera della soluzione verso quindi un paese è una filiera non solo quindi della conoscenza, ma della capacità di un sistema quindi Italia, delle amministrazioni, ma anche quindi dell'imprenditore, dell'imprenditore che ha la sua forza, anche quindi economica, ma dell'imprenditore che ha anche la sua quindi, capacità di poter accogliere per formare quei, eh, quelle forze quindi locali che poi nel loro contesto locale possono introdurre l'innovazione. Cioè abbiamo quindi bisogno quindi, di un sistema che collabori. Questo è, sono tanti comunque i paesi, anche la stessa quindi, Etiopia, dove siamo coinvolti, oggi abbiamo anche quindi ascoltato il discorso della malnutrizione, siamo fortissimamente impegnati in un programma della cooperazione italiana come aiutare alcune popolazioni a cambiare la loro dieta, creare quindi anche quindi dei, dei giardini o degli orti che possano quindi diventare punti quindi per la produzione di quella integrazione di vitamine o anche quindi di altri quindi elementi. Ma altri contesti importanti, come per esempio anche quello della meccanizzazione, prima il Vice Ministro parlava dell'importanza della meccanizzazione, non indicare macchine per lavorare, ma indicare attraverso la macchina quale soluzione alla domanda di una filiera locale esistente che può permettere quindi di raggiungere quella qualità, altrimenti il mercato che già loro hanno non può continuare ad essere quindi una un'opportunità, non può avere quella sostenibilità. Ecco, metterci a fianco. Dalla parola appunto, eh, quella quindi della formazione, arriviamo poi al momento di lavorare insieme con loro e certamente per un ritorno nostro, non solo di posizione italiana, ma anche quindi per un'integrazione di quell'imprenditoria che vuole attraverso quei paesi anche rafforzarsi all'estero. Eh sì, beh... Sicuramente, come dicevo in uno dei momenti prima, ehm, veramente il settore agroalimentare è un settore dove l'impegno, la sostenibilità, eh, l'attenzione e l'impresa possono andare eh, a braccetto. Certo, non le 7-8 imprese che ci faceva vedere Maria, ma hanno altre, non, ne faccio ne non voglio neanche fare una questione etica, hanno altre priorità hanno altri meccanismi, hanno altre logiche, eh, ma c'è invece una modalità di, che noi in Italia conosciamo bene, no? di sfruttare anche il piccolo produttore che si unisce in consorzio, si unisce in cooperativa, 
ne siamo venuti fuori dalla guerra con, eh, con questo sistema, lo conosciamo eh, e pensiamo eh, che possa essere una chiave utile eh, anche per altre zone del mondo. Io mi occupo di Africa, quindi scusate se torno sempre sull'Africa, ma eh, un certo approccio cooperativo, consortile, eh, è assolutamente identico e applicabile eh, al sistema africano, cioè eh, il sistema delle comunità di cui parlava prima Marcella, no? Noi avevamo i comuni, cioè ogni campanile, ogni territorio aveva il suo eh, frantoio dove portare l'olio, dove fare... Eh, si metteva insieme una cooperativa, un territorio per produrre il vino, l'olio, il grano e così via. Andrea, ehm, tu lavori su questo anche, no? Come un ido, proprio su questo link tra le necessità di un territorio, di un paese, di una politica e il settore privato sano, il medio piccolo, ma anche grande con attenzione, insomma. Dell'introduzione perché mi dà la possibilità proprio di rivolgerci a, principalmente alle istituzioni e alle aziende italiane che sono le controparti dei nostri beneficiari finali, che sono appunto eh, le aziende, le piccole aziende dei paesi, dei paesi in via di sviluppo. Eh, il nostro ufficio, che è l'Ufficio delle Nazioni Unite per lo Sviluppo Industriale in Italia, è un ufficio che ha un mandato molto particolare, cioè quello di promuovere investimenti, trasferimenti di tecnologia e formazione a beneficio di questi paesi, utilizzando in contesti di win-win eh, quella che è l'espertise italiana dal punto di vista tecnologico di know-how. Il match è, in, è, è perfetto, come, come dicevi tu, perché... Eh, la maggior parte dei paesi in via di sviluppo contano un'economia soprattutto informale di piccolissime microimprese e il tessuto imprenditoriale italiano è un tessuto fatto di oltre il 96% di piccole e medie imprese. Quelli sono i eh, veicoli con cui noi appunto arriviamo a determinate attività e i termini di, di co-sviluppo, di... Eh, sono tutti termini che ovviamente eh, si sposano bene con la nostra attività che è quella di rendere progetti di cooperazione non solo sostenibili dal punto di vista eh, sociale e ambientale ma anche dal punto di vista economico cioè progetti che eh, stiano in piedi e che abbiano appunto una, eh, una durata nel, nel tempo perché l'agribusiness è prioritario per noi? Perché sono prioritari per noi tutti i settori dove l'Italia eccelle, principalmente l'agribusiness. L'agribusiness eh, conta i due terzi del, eh, della forza lavoro dei paesi in via di sviluppo e un terzo del, del PIL, è la colonna portante di questi paesi e, e l'Italia ha tanto da offrire in questo, in questo settore. Perché tecnologia? Perché tecnologia? Perché è quello che manca, che complementa. E, però la tecnologia, e qua torniamo al tema della, della, della conferenza, deve sposarsi per essere massimizzata con eh, le tradizioni locali e eh, le culture locali e soprattutto l'expertise locale. Quindi questo è il eh, tema, innovation in tradition, perché, perché va valorizzata l'expertise locale. Eh, tu sei appassionato d'Africa, eh, io pure, noi tutti anche, quindi vi porto l'esempio per esempio del Mozambico, che è un paese eh, che è interessantissimo dal punto di vista agribusiness, come diceva la Vice Ministra, 36 milioni di ettari arabili di cui solo il 9% sfruttato. In alcune parti del nord del paese hanno tre raccolti l'anno senza meccanizzazione agricola e senza fertilizzanti. Quindi il potenziale è Un paese è enorme. che assomiglia molto all'Italia, no? si sviluppa in verticale, quindi ha una serie di microclimi da un punto di vista agricolo, anche di terreni diversi come da noi. No? Esattamente, esattamente, molto interessante esattamente. noi abbiamo un progetto finanziato dalla cooperazione italiana, implementato dal nostro ufficio, in collaborazione con la controparte locale che è l'Apex, che è l'Agenzia Nazionale di eh, Sviluppo degli Investimenti, di Promozione degli Investimenti, e, e il nostro focus, eh, considerando anche le difficoltà comunque del, 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 del Paese sotto alcuni punti di vista, è stato proprio quello di concentrarci sul grande potenziale del, del Paese 
grande consiglio del Paese eh, in linea con il tema appunto del, dell'innovazione eh, tradizionale, cioè individuare quelle che sono le nicchie eh, di prodotto che valorizzino le culture locali e che quindi facciano di una sfida grandissima un'opportunità. Un eh, due esempi, uno dei progetti che sosteniamo è per esempio un progetto e per la produzione di farina di banane, le banane che non hanno accesso ai mercati vicini e neanche l'accesso uh, all'Unione Europea. Eh, abbiamo sviluppato dal punto di vista tecnico e dal punto di vista anche di ricerca di investitori un, un, un progetto che le lavora, che lavora le, le banane verdi e fa una farina di banana che ha alti valori eh, nutri, okay. nutritivi e che è un prodotto, diciamo, che non è solo buono per il mercato locale, ma è anche buono per il mercato internazionale, perché è un prodotto, un prodotto di nicchia. Se pensiamo che anche qua in Italia, la farina di Camut, fino a 15 anni fa, andavamo appunto a, a, agli allevamenti, era per dare da mangiare agli animali, adesso ha un uh, market price molto più alto della farina normale. E questo vuol dire eh, innovation in tradition, valorizzare l'espertise locale. Il fatto che non si utilizzano tanti fertilizzanti, abbiamo un'azienda italiana del nostro network che eh, svilupperà delle produzioni organiche, locali, quindi eh, in realtà si, si può fare veramente, soprattutto in questi paesi, il leapfrog, cioè oh, il, il saltare a determinati, determinati, determinati stadi di, di sviluppo e arrivare anzi a, a produzioni con la tecnologia che abbiamo, con l'utilizzo dei big data, con l'utilizzo dell'innovazione dell in agribusiness su cui insomma, noi abbiamo una fortissima sensibilità a tutto quello che è il, il contenuto innovativo locale. Prendo, perché mi hai fatto un assist, era la domanda che avrei voluto fare a Fabrice De Clerc. If you think uh, that um, with innovation in tradition, the, the uh, agroecology can help some parts of our world, I'm, uh, I talk about Africa, it's, it's to great. leapfrog, Okay, I, I'm talking again about Africa because we have seen this leapfrog coming out from the paper in the reality with communication, for example. So we, we, we saw a, co a, a, a continent that had a big problem in communication like 15 years ago with fixed line, uh, from telephone line, then the mobile arrived and everything changed. Do you think in the agro, agri sector we can have something similar with the ag agroecology system? Oh, it's without, without doubt. And I think we're also now talking about leapfrogging diets uh, in Africa, particularly around dietary diversity. I mean, we're seeing that Western diets are catastrophic, right? 80% overweight in the U.S., 50% obese. And this is, and then we're looking to Africa and say, why don't you mimic the production system that we have in the U.S.? so that Africa can repeat the catastrophic food system that we have in the U.S. and Europe. So absolutely there's room for, for leapfrogging. But I, I want to go back to the first video, that, that those students in the field with the tractor. And to me, this is the classic stereotype of agroecology versus industrial ecology, uh, industrial agriculture. And so we're, we're led here in this video to say, oh, those poor students, if only they knew how to innovate. What are we innovating for, I think is my question. That tractor, is fantastic at increasing labor efficiency, it's fantastic at increasing yields per hectare, but it's dumping carbon into the atmosphere and it's not helping us keep nutrients in the soil. And so what we need is that that tractor is a biodiversity replacing technology. But if we look to food systems for the future, just like Miriam very nicely said, is that we need the and, 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 and uh, of food. And so we need tractors that produce food and soil so store soil carbon and that keep nutrients out of the water and uh, that allow us to leave room for biodiversity providing pollination and pest control functions. And so when we look through the room here, what the innovations are that we look at season ships, let's think about what are we innovating for? And this, this, this point, Miriam, you had this, this, this feed the world narrative, I think is really fascinating. I, I work with the CGIR and also with EAT. We very much are in this feed this world uh, narrative and that we're focused on how do you feed 9.5 billion people? We, we've looked at, uh, with our colleague Chris Murray uh, at the uh, University of Washington, what would it take to feed 9.5 billion people healthy diets from sustainable production systems? And so when you look at what a healthy diet is in terms of food composition, 
primarily plant-based, highly diversified, less meat consumption. If you look at that from a global production point of view, we are overproducing red meat by 450%. We're overproducing grain by 60%. We're underproducing fruits, nuts, and vegetables on orders of magnitude of 30 to 60% for each of those categories. And so we look at how do you feed 9.5 billion people in 2050? We're stuck in this feed the world mentality. Chris Murray is telling us, look folks, you can't feed today's 7 billion people healthy diets. And so the solution is uh, we're looking at it, change what we're producing, increase productivity of the ingredients of Italy's famous Mediterranean diet. More fruits, more nuts, more vegetables, less refined, more, more whole grains. The Mediterranean diet is a classic example of, of a healthy diet. So this is, this is dietary diversity. And this is, I think, an area where production needs to learn from the nutrition community and begin to produce those foods which allow our nutritionists and our public health officials to address what really is a global public health crisis, undernutrition and malnutrition. Back to production, uh, Miriam uh, showed that great example of, of the work with Johan Rockstrom and the Stockholm Resilience Center, not the Stockholm Environmental Center. Uh, Johan would want me to correct that. This eats a, a scientific secretariat, the, the planetary boundaries. And I think you should, you should pay attention to what this planetary boundaries concept says. We all talk about climate and carbon, but the two boundaries that were by far over exceeded in the, that concept is biodiversity, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. So what we're working on now with EAT is, is a Lancet Commission on Healthy Diets from Central Production Systems that's looking at what are the food system boundaries for five of those, those boundaries. Nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, land, biodiversity, uh, and water. Uh, and we'll be producing that report in, in September. But what I want to clarify on the biodiversity piece is that this is not about giraffes, elephants, panda bears, koala bears, etc. These are important in their own right. But when we're talking about biodiversity, we are talking about that component of the Earth system which is driving all of these cycles. Biodiversity is what stores carbon, it's what regulates nitrogen, it's what regulates phosphorus, it's what allows us to maintain these multiple functions in, in production systems. The world's biggest ecosystem is not tropical forests, it's agricultural ecosystems, and it's the place where we have the least information on biodiversity and its function. We know a lot about the gut microbiome and its relationship to our understanding human metabolism, nutritional metabolism, macrobiodiversity does the same thing in terms of earth system processes. It is what metabolizes or drives global metabolism, but we know absolutely nothing about how agricultural biodiversity makes that contribution. So one of the pieces that we're working on with biodiversity with support with the, the Italian uh, government uh, is uh, an agricultural biodiversity index, which brings together the role of biodiversity in diet, the role of biodiversity in sustainable production systems, and genetic diversity, well, our main, if you want, tool to making production systems resilient against the unknowns of climate change, the unknowns of economic change, the unknowns uh, of social change, bringing those three dimensions of agricultural biodiversity together in a single index, hopefully to help us to better understand how to manage agricultural biodiversity for human health, environmental health, uh, and global resilience. Thank you very much, Fabrice. Mm, I would like mm, Catherine Gatundo, Actually, it is one big international NGO. And uh, for example, I didn't know it worked on these topics. So I, I knew actually for other, other sector. I would like to, what, what do you do on, on, on all we are talking about? Thank you. Um, I think all that has been spoken here is basically what we do. It's about the people. We work with the people. We work with communities. And I think one of the things that needs to be emphasized and come out of this panel here is the centrality of the people in, agro in agroecology as a system. It's not just a technical system. It's a social system. It's about the people. It's about the women who provide all the labor to produce the food and how they innovate, how they generate indigenous knowledge, how they share that knowledge as they go to the river to fetch water. They are, they are conversing and sharing this knowledge. How do they do their own homegrown extension services among themselves, and how do we support that? But one of the challenges that for us is actually we think is important, we are entering into the decade of family farming. We are saying that the family farming is the way where we need to grow our food production system, and it's about those families. But what, what are the leaders, what are the governments doing to support this idea? 
policy coherence, for example, in most of the structures that we have in Africa, we have the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program that was alluded to from Mozambique, a commitment for all governments to put 10% of their national budget to agriculture. But what agriculture are we talking about? Are we talking about the agriculture that the farmers in Africa are, are, are engaged in? So the 80% of the women, of the rural women that are producing the food, are they visible to those who are driving CADEP? The other challenge that we have, of course, is resources. Uh, we are seeing that um, when we are looking at the IPAS report, there is a lot of power and holders of resources that focus more on quantity of food production, and particularly monocultures. The, the, the smallholders will not have the resources to do the same. Uh, do we, we need to shift. We need to shift where we are putting the resources for the purpose and for the sake of sustainability of our society, for the sustainability not just of food but of the people. For me, I think it's about where the people sit and wh how, we, how visible they are. But the problem with, uh, with what you're talking about is that uh, I've been talking with, the, with some African officials of agriculture. In the, if we talk about uh, family farming, it's the government that is supposed to provide help and financial instruments and seeds and all yes. this stuff. Uh, it's easier to have a big company coming in the country and putting money and machines and, you know. So I think, uh, as you told, uh, Probably the, the, the greatest work we have to do is on the policymaker. Absolutely. Absolutely, it's on the policymakers. The IPES report was lo talking about the eight lockings. One of them is what is it that we measure as success? And that export market, for example, of voluminous production of food is what will be more visible as success. But then you realize that hunger malnutrition is growing because the people who are producing either small, in small scale or who would ordinarily be the consumers of the food, don't, don't have nutritious food because they are, they, they are exposed to the food that is not of their choice. Their own innovation for seed production, for example, is outlawed. There are many national governments in Africa that are developing laws that will outlaw uh, indigenous production and storage and sharing of, of, of seeds and, and pushing farmers to get, to get their seeds from the market. So the traditional indigenous innovation dies at that point. So the focus on the leaders, yes, I agree, is very, very important for that policy coherence. Thank you very much. Uh, Tiberio Chiari um, of uh, Italian Agency for Cooperation dell'Agenzia Italiana per la Cooperazione e lo Sviluppo. Um, che ne pensa di questa parte finale che arriva proprio in quello che voi fate? <coughs> Abbiamo cinque minuti. Perfetto. Uh, I've also some slides, so I thank all, and I'm at the, at the last. Uh, I really appreciate all the intervention because also they uh, changed my presentation in my mind, and uh, I, I want to say what I, uh, I was usually saying in my presentation in Ethiopia. Eh? I speak about especially in a case, eh? it's a big case, eh? because 100 million habitants is a big case. Uh, starting from one point, uh, smallholders are, are the expert. Uh, are not uh, uh, something out of the game. They are the main actor, they are the protagonist, and they are the expert at local level. I want to uh, set, uh, underline the point. Second point is uh, agroecology. Agroecology can be defined simply as respect of our mother. It's a very simple definition. How you can change the world if you don't have respect to your, your mother. It's impossible. So it is a very simple definition. What is innovation? Innovation is, you can, is, is a synonym of development. No development without innovation. The man is from the prehistoric time is making innovation. So what is introducing development? What is cooperation introducing? Is, the, is introducing the view out of the pond. Farmer are expert, but Unfortunately, they live into the pond. Here is the role of international cooperation, international expert, all the agencies to enable new strategy. And these strategy are not requiring huge amount of money. To be sustainable, they have to self-generate resources. Can do? Yes, they can. If you start a project, 
you start a, a philosophy, a vision, a value chain in which the market is local because all our friends in Africa, they usually eat every day. Three times a day or more, they usually dress. They, they are asking for goods, all kind of goods. Why somebody else has to provide them the goods they need? They can produce their own goods. So, where are resources? Simply they are producing the add value that they are going to pay. So, I, I'm speaking because I have the experience in Ethiopia. I, I, I can go very through, very rapidly, if you, if you allow me. Sorry, okay. Well, the, 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 you see the, the, the vision is that uh, you have to link the, uh, the, 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 the field to the fork, eh? of course, in the, in the wheat. And going to, well, biodiversity is the richness, it's a big country. Wheat is everywhere, it's, it's more than one million and a half hectares, it's, it's involved more than five million smallholder families, so you have to multiply by 10. Eh? If you want to, biodiversity is enormous, 10,000 accession, X accessions you put in the field, is plenty of biodiversity. Eh? When you extract this small bag and you put in the field, wow, it's an explosion of biodiversity. Eh? But it is the problem. It is very much fragmented. Each farmer dispose of 0 0.8 hectares with wheat 0 0.3 hectare. Eh? You can imagine to put together this product. These are the, the, eh? the kidmen. Eh? You know, it is eh? Stone Age agriculture. Yes, it is Stone Age agriculture. Can, do, can they make the change? Can they make the jump in the future? Yes, they can. Also, they must do the, eh, the jam because they are growing up. That biodiversity was created here when this population was about 10 million inhabitants. So that biodiversity was created for the desire of 10 million farmers, not 100 million people. So strategy introduce mechanization you can see also a, a plane for spraying this was a strategy create big state farm 2003 4000 hectares to produce for the people the top down approach the state farm produced for the people these are the results it's very uniform very eh? they introduce new varieties eh? bread wheat instead of the durum wheat the eh? historical eh? crop they didn't succeed eh, to avoid the, the imports. And now there is a big problem, eh? the rust, the, the, the pests, the pathogens. We are facing a new, also in Europe, a new pandemic of a disease. All the world is working, maybe many of you knows, with billions of dollars to solve the issue, but the issue was created by uniformity. So we need a leverage. The pasta was a leverage in Ethiopia because they used to eat pasta. There are industry, but they cannot solve the issue. They are importing pasta again. Why? Because Ethiopia, fortunately, is getting richer. And when you get richer, you want to dispose of better product. So what does it mean? That you don't want anymore the pasta 1.0, the pasta made with bread wheat, eh? because you know it is sticky. You want to eat the pasta 2.0, eh? the one with durum wheat inside. Eh? The one we, of course, they want to. Eh? It, is a, it is luxury to have the pasta 3.0 made in Italy, eh? because but it's like Ferrari for them. But it's okay. The two, what what means? What we did? We we try to change the traditional system that poor farmer in provider for the industry, quality, quantity, quantity, quality. Over the time, this was the challenge. Well, how we, we define a project, we define a value chain, we selected zone, we involve everybody, everybody is to be in the game. The main actor I don't go through is cooperative and farmers. You need to work at a scale. So forget the individual smallholder farmer. He has to work together. This is common in Africa. All the farmers in Africa work together. Eh? This individualistic vision is not part of their eh, vision. It's not part of them. So why you have to introduce this is a, is a madness. So these are the unions. We involve a minimum number of unions. 
around 9,000 farmers. We're training some facilities, stores, some equipment. But the point was to be fast, eh? to generate resources. The game has to be perfect, immediately functioning and producing return. If so, was the game, it increased fastly. How? Acting on some critical point in the market. When you, when you provide your grain to the industry, what does it mean? The price has to be according to quality, not according to quantity. This is the business for middlemen, the quantity, but the quality is a matter of the farmers. Only big quantity, no individual. The contract to be signed, the contract to be on the TV. This was on the TV, national TV. Control of quality, innovation, new equipment. The result was that in three years we start from scratch and we reach 50,000 quintals. The years subsequent, I was out of scale because the increase was still increasing. Eh? You see here, eh? it was 150,000 quintals. And so we, we had to enlarge this, to introduce the privates, to have a fair to introduce the industry, the in, the, these industrial people, 30 companies of Ethiopia producing past in biscuits and uh, came in Italy in the sport to visit also plants. And the, the increase was still growing up. Half million quintals last year, one million quintals. So where are the resources? The resources are generated locally. So what, what is the model? Uh, uh, sorry, but the model, it, normally, it, you see it like a, a spiral, eh? the, 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 virtu the virtuous circle is like a, a spring. No, the model is a tornado. The tornado is very weak at the beginning. Eh? You can disperse the wind. When it gets power, it is self-generating energy. It is attracting energy. You cannot stop it. It is a smart, of course, it's not, not disruptive. Grazie. Okay, this is the future, <laughs> and this is the main results. This farmer is representative of the community. He received some awards from the bank because many farmers open bank account and from, of course, the political authority after the bank who provided an award to him. Thank you. Grazie. Io devo dire che l'ho visto sul campo tutto il lavoro che avete fatto sulla pasta in Etiopia perché poi l'ambasciatore Mistretta era un sostenitore convinto e, e, ed è veramente un tornado. Il, il risultato vero lo vedremo secondo me fra 10-15 anni. Allora abbiamo ancora 4 minuti prima che il regista, prima di invitare poi Leonardo Carmenati a chiudere la sessione se c'è qualche domanda perché mi avete tolto il tempo lasciatemelo che mi è utile grazie eh, se avete se c'è qualche domanda if there is some question from, from the audience hi everybody um, I participated last week to a um, workshop on agroecology with Professor Miguel Altieri, organized by ARPA Umbria. And there were s roughly about 30 students from, they were all, most of them were uh, agronomists, but for them that was the only way to learn something about agroecology because there's no way to learn anything about agroecology in our university. So I wonder if it's just a problem, if it's an Italian problem, or if it's a problem of knowledge, of global knowledge. Thank you. Oh. There is, we have four minutes. Another question? Yeah? Yeah? Thank you. Uh, hello. I, I just um, wanted to mention something. Yesterday in the talk of John Kerry, he mentioned that the only country that's sustainable is actually Vietnam, but you know he's very poor. <laughs> and why not have a look, if they are sustainable, why not having a look what they are doing right and trying to 
extrapolated it, why it has to be richness uh, together with destruction and poorness together with sustainable, why not copy also these actions that happen on the field, on the poor countries with the f poor farmers and extrapolated them also here, for example. I read this case of an agricultural farmer in Vietnam, which is cultivating rice, collegating fishery and the production of ducks, which eat the weeds and then the forest surrounded to create um, an ecological system that helps and it's, it's excellent. And they provide also food for their families. And here, I mean, you have this intensive cropping. Why not uh, cropping also something that's done for the small farmer that's also very, uh, it has a great knowledge and it can help also here. Who want to answer the last question and then we go back to the first one that is very interesting. I think for, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah. for I mean, for, for your question, I think I think it's 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 a really great question. There's many models of sustainable production systems, and I, I work with the with the farm just outside my house. And yesterday was planting day, and I missed it for the first time in many years. But but th th there's many models. But I think what's important is we understand what do we want our production systems to do, and, and we want them to produce enough food for 9.5 billion. We want them to contribute. We want them to change from the source of climate degradation, biodiversity loss, environmental degradation, to places where we bring food back within boundaries. And so I think what we need clarity on, particularly for the private sector and for policy, is what is, what is the two degrees of food? What does sustainable production look like? And then allow many models, the, the, the diversity of solutions that Miriam was talking about, really rise up to that. And some of it will come from Vietnam. California rice farms outside of Sacramento are another fantastic example. The community support agricultural baskets in many communities worldwide are, are great examples. Costa Rica's agroforestry systems are also great examples. But we need to be clear to our policymakers that what we want from our cultural landscapes is this and, and, and. Food and health and environmental sustainability. We're long past this food or environment. That, that's no longer a functional model. So we need policies, incentives that allow us to recognize the and, 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 and biodiversity's contribution to getting those ands. Thank you very much. Uh, Tiberio, can I ask to, to answer who, because I, I, I don't know if it's an Italian problem, but there is someone that teach uh, agroecology or? <laughs> As I was saying before, uh, we have one minute, sir. Eh? Then one the minute. director yeah, yeah, very is very terrible. Very terrible. I think that, uh, at least in my, in my, eh, during my study, the, the first example, the first text was the text of the Bucolica, the Georgica of Virgilio. Eh? Virgilio was eh, a Latin eh, scriptor. And he wrote two texts, Bucolica and Georgica, like a, a, a sort of um, glorification of the beauty of the work in, 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 in the agar, eh? in, the, in the field. So this is the base eh? Eh? For, for us, eh? for Italian, for, uh, from the Latin. Eh? So uh, I'm a bit surprised that it is not eh? farthly di disseminated, this knowledge, because really I say it is a, a sort of respect eh? that we, we must have to our mother. So uh, all the other is a vision of changing the reality. Industrial uh, agriculture is changing the context in which we produce, but it's like to have the, eh, the, the livestock in a confinated space. Eh? You are creating something different. It's like the space agriculture, eh? when we are thinking to go in Mars. Eh? So. Marcella, and the rest of the world? Some Thank you very much. Them. Well, actually, the initiative we launched uh, uh, has as one of its three main pillars on education and knowledge. Uh, FAO already has uh, uh, partnerships with the RU Forum, for example, which is 80 African universities on oh. agriculture, uh, and Urual, for example, just to name a couple of examples, Union de Universidades de América Latina, 206 universities in Latin America. We are promoting uh, courses at master's level also on agroecology. So we are addressing that from the FAO perspective. Now I would like to invite Leonardo Carmenati of Italian Agency for Development and Cooperation. Mm. Just the closing remarks and thank you very much. So 
Thank you for inviting us to this important event. Uh, I think that it's quite difficult, you know, to, to make a, a, a resume of the, the interesting uh, discussion about uh, agroecological and all this theme. But mm, le le let me try. I, I was really amazed about uh, what uh, the Vice Minister of Mozambique was speaking about. I was really amazed about the the uh, level of uh, planning and, and, and real clear uh, issues that they, start, that they are targeting and uh, the, the official request of investment in their country uh, that should be, should be confident in, in this case because such, such a country is uh, having uh, such a clear idea of the, the, their planning in, in, this, in this area. And then we, we have been, has been touched many, many other, many other topic uh, around uh, agricultural, around uh, environment, and the respect of environment. And uh, Ambassador Marabodi was speaking about uh, the increasing of needs, the, the, the increasing of the population, especially in uh, in some area, which is an important. Uh, way of, uh, of thinking about, about the phenomenon. Uh, I mean, uh, somebody was speaking about that we have learned that uh, we should move from uh, uniformity to, to diversity. And this is matching with many of the, of, of the principles uh, about, about cooperation that is matching even to, to giving respect to the, to the uh, local community. We have been speaking about education. Uh, start, starting from there, uh, giving, uh, giving the chance uh, to understand better. We are speaking about technology and, um, and we are speaking about the uh, social role of the, of the agricultural system and uh, in, in improving, improving on, on, on these regards. But I, I think that uh, um, is, is, is very important to, to, to think in, even in terms of uh, developing uh, and the, the increasing of the needs is increasing the level of our responsibility uh, in terms of being actor and being able to intervene uh, in, in, in this field. We are talking about essentially to, to heal the world, to respect our world, to respect our world in a way that uh, is uh, the benefit uh, is, is starting from the local community and can be shared to, to all of us. And, uh, and this is something that uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to, to understand better how important and uh, how lucky I am in, in the position of giving uh, our small contribution in, uh, on this regard. The, the, the Italian uh, Agency of Cooperation and Development, uh, jointly with the, the Director General of uh, Cooperation and Development of the Foreign Minister, I think is in the, in the pathways of, of uh, wha what we are talking about today from, from many, from many points of view. Because the Italian cooperation is skilled to promote initiative and project targeting all the issues uh, I have mentioned. As witnessed by the best practice we have been presented today to, on, on this regard. I would like to stress also the global Italian financial commitment towards food security and nutrition. I think for, from my point of view is important. According to the last G7 financial report, the food security and nutrition published early this year and compiled under the Italian presidency of G7, around 100.6 million US dollar have been invested by Italy in 2015 for projects and programs aimed at and provided direct assistance on agriculture, fisheries, food security and nutrition. Special attention has been paid to initiatives addressing climate change adaption and mitigation on 49% of all the initiatives founded in 2015 by the Italian cooperation targeting food security and nutrition included climate change adapt adaptation objective and 55% included climate change mitigation objective. 
All these initiatives, through the increasing of food security, have also allowed to fight against one of the root cases of migration and to increase the resilience of rural communities, providing development perspective also in emergency context. Just this frame on my of my prepared speech, uh, I think is, uh, is giving the, the, the possibility to understand how the it Italian system uh, is training is best. And uh, I think that uh, the, the comment that uh, I can say that is uh, in, uh, in, in, as I said, in, in the pathway, so we were uh, listening from, from many points of view and from, from many different uh, contributions. Let me conclude saying that the willingness of Italian cooperation to promote food security is today very firm. We are aware that in order to reach the SDGs 2, the effort of both public and private sectors should converge. To this end, the Italian Agency of Development Cooperation intends to promote, please, the first Italian public-private platform on food security and nutrition that will be launched later this afternoon in this event and in a dedicated session of seed and chips at 3 p.m. at the arena. Through the, this platform, the agency will work as a catalyst of Italian stakeholders involved in agro-food sector in order to strengthen the role of the Sistema Italia in development cooperation on food security and nutrition. So in, in, in conclusion, in the last conclusion, I think every of us should do our part and please uh, join. We, we got all the tools, we got, we got agreements, we got the, the knowledge, we got the commitment. And uh, I think that to put in system uh, all this input and uh, uh, will give us the chance to change, to change uh, some, some reality. So thank you for uh, inviting us uh, to this important event uh, and I hope to see you at three o'clock uh, to discuss about how to join the private sector to the public for this kind of regard. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to the panelists because we respected the time. It seemed impossible, but we did. Thank you very much. Thank you.